Well, this is Bishop Ronald Powell from Crosswinds International. We want to welcome all of our viewing audience wherever you're coming from around the world. God bless you for tuning in, and, and we just pray that today will be a day that the Word of God will speak to you and it will develop you in the way that God wants you to be developed. I'm going to be talking to you about development of the eyes of your heart. And everybody is going to look at this kind of cockeyed when we start speaking about it because I'm going to talk to you about visualization. Visions and visualization are the very same thing. The word visualize and visual, uh, vision are the same thing, and it's spoken of in the word. Now, years ago, back when everybody was doing their uh, their dissertations, there were people that were talking bad about people that visualize. And then they, they started talking about, you know, vain things that happen in visualization. And that. No, listen to me. You have to discern the truth from a lie. Now, I'm going to show you today that visualization is not some sort of a new age thing. That's an old age thing that goes all the way back to Abraham and probably beyond. But I'm going to give you word on it. I'm not, I don't want you to take my opinion. I want you to get the word of God <coughs> and understand what this means to you because when we start looking at the promises of the word, they don't change. God doesn't change. Jesus doesn't change. The Holy Spirit doesn't change. They're the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So he is his word. Jesus is the word of God manifest in the flesh. So when he came here, he actually started speaking about some of these things. But before we get to Jesus on this subject matter, we're going to go back to uh, God speaking to Abraham, and he gave him a vision. Now I want you to listen to this, and we'll see it again in verse 22 of Genesis. I mean, uh, chapter 22 of Genesis. But... When God spoke to Abraham, he said, after he spoke to him, he said, go outside. He went outside of his tent. He said, look up. I'm going to make you the father of many nations. I'm going to cause your sons and daughters to be like the stars. They're innumerable. That word innumerable for somebody that doesn't have the education that they should yet. Innumerable means you can't count them all. That God is going to give so many descendants to you that you can't count them. Now, why is that important? And I'm going to tell you that too. In, uh, in the Word of God, He wanted him to have a vision of the promise that He was giving him. Anytime that you get the Word of God, you need a vision, not just a thought. You can forget what you were thinking, but if you add a picture to it, you'll never forget it. And that's one of the things that I do when I'm meditating. I put and I'll read the scripture, and then I'll, I'll mull it over in my mind, but I'm putting pictures with that promise that God has made. Those promises are to everyone who believes, and all believers are born again. There's going to be somebody out, I can hear them out there. Not everybody that believes is born again. Everybody that believes in Jesus Christ is born again. Sir, madam, read your book. Genesis chapter 15, verse 5, it says in the New King James Version, and I have all these people that say, well, I don't, I don't read anything but King James. Well, this is King James. It's just New King James. That's since we've got the Qumran and the, and the scrolls. We know a little more about the interpretation of that than they did when King James uh, had those 50 scholars doing this. And it should be able to speak to you and, and help you to understand a little better. So, Genesis 15, 5 in, in the New King James, it says, Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. That's a pretty big promise. 
and to somebody that doesn't have, and that's 80 years old and doesn't have uh, a child one. And you're going to have descendants as the, the stars of the heavens. Okay. We got to get to one yet, Lord. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fifteen six says this, and he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. So, here we have an example of godly imagery which produced faith in the man who is called the father of faith in Romans 4.11. And that's a powerful concept. You've got to understand that God actually made him the father of everybody that would have faith from then on. If we believe, and here he says that to him, he, he believed God and he accounted it to him as righteousness. So that would indicate that if we uh, wanted faith in our hearts that would move a mountain, that we would have to have the same ingredients which God gave to Abraham. Now, other than that, that would make us children of a different God because God give, gives a, a word and it doesn't change and it's to all who believe. And that's in the Scripture and the New Testament as well. But so we're going to 22:17 because I, I looked it up and I thought, God, you gave me that in my dream, so I'm going to look it up. Genesis 22 and 17. I will surely bless you. I will multiply your descendants like the stars in the sky and the sands on the seashore. This is getting really big here you see because the same have you have you ever considered counting if you got involved in counting the sands of the seashore just one square acre of that how many would that be well you don't know <laughs> god is doing something with abraham and and he wants everybody to understand this I will surely bless you. I will multiply your descendants like the stars of the sky and the sands of the seashore. Your descendants will possess the gates of their enemies. That means that they will always be victorious over the enemy. And through your offspring, all nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Obedience goes into this, but visualization does too. The vision here, listen to me. When you go outside, God has given you this vision. And uh, you look up, and it's nighttime, and you see all the stars, and you remember the promise. Go out in the daytime, and you see all the sand in the desert and on the seashore, and, and you remember the promise. There's nowhere you can look you don't remember the promise. So God gave pi pictures to Abraham to keep his faith built. Now, I'm going to uh, talk to you about this just a little more and give you a little history on it. But anyway, today we're talking about godly, not vain imaginations, but godly imagination. Because, you know, there's a lot of seashore in the world. Have you ever been to the beach? Yeah. Are any two of them alike? They all have sand, they all have surf, but the truth is, is they've got all kinds of terrain around them that is different. So, when, when we, we've got that imagination, it's going, to, it's going to be an imagination of according to what God has said, a visualization or a vision, when you hear that in the Bible, that God gives visions and dreams, see, he's talking about this very thing. He's telling the man, this is what I want you to remember about what I'm saying to you. So anyway, we're going to define God. this as godly uh, imagination as picturing the things the Bible says that are true. Would you say amen to that? Okay. So Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 in the New King James Version. Hebrews 11, 6 says this, uh, but without faith, you know this, right? But without faith it is impossible to please him, meaning God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder 
of those that diligently seek Him. I'm going to show you some principles in the Word today that will take you away from mediocre uh, kind of relationships with God. So I want you to remember this as best you can, and I'm asking the Holy Spirit to give you some visuals. And that's the reason I put an eyeball behind this on our screen. So anyway, it's impossible to please God if you don't believe God, if you don't believe in God, if you don't believe what His Word says. It's impossible to please Him. But what did it say about Abraham? He believed God, and God counted, counted it for righteousness. Okay? He also says that to the person that diligently, that means every day, all day long, through the day, they're remembering things about God, what God said, and that kind of thing, to, uh, to challenge their, uh, their flesh. See, and I'm going to show you some things in the Scripture today that will tell you about how God sees you. Okay? So, and you shall seek me. Let me go on. Jeremiah 29, 12 through 14, it says, Then you shall you'll call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me. You call on me, Heavenly Father, and then you'll pray unto me, whatever your petition, and I will hear you. I will hearken unto you, the Bible says. And you shall seek me, and you will find me when you search for me with all of your heart. This is a very important scripture to all of us. You can't have other things in your mind. You know how double-minded you are. You don't get anything from God with a double mind. So you have to actually focus, and that focus would have to be a vision of whatever you see is God. There's an image somewhere in your head, whether it has a face or not, that you're going to see him. I always see him in white and so bright in the face I can't really actually make out any kind of an image. And I think that's actually scriptural too, isn't it? We can go there and show you that in the in Revelation. So anyway, but he says, You'll seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart, not double-minded. How much do you get from God when you've got a double mind or a distracted mind? If you're distracted, get rid of whatever is distracting you and then go back to the Lord and... In that moment when you're being distracted, say to the Lord, forgive me. Now, I want to bring all my attention to bear upon my time with you, my relationship with you. That's a single mind and a single heart, and God will reward you every time. Okay? Did I make that clear? Every time. All right. God is not a liar. You know, whatever he speaks, it's gonna, he's watching over it to make it happen. But he also says that from the, the negative side, if you are double-minded, you get nothing. If you'll put yourself in the place where you're focused and you need a, you need a visual for that focus, in your mind, I, I, I get on my knees and, I, and, and I, in my mind I see him standing above me and my head bowed, and I'm praying. And I'm focused on, to him, on him, and then at the end of my prayer, I thank him for hearing my prayer and answering my prayer. And 100% of the time, he answers. Does he answer right away? We'll get into that too. Now, to prepare you for getting disciplined in your life, we've got to read Scripture and give you Scriptures that are going to cause you to know that this is not my opinion. I won't listen to religious rhetoric. I have to have the Word of God behind anything that I say to you. I don't want to stand here and have to come into condemnation for giving you an opinion. Colossians chapter 3 this is a little wordy, but we'll, we'll go in it and try to explain it to you. Chapter 3, verse 2 through 10. It says, set your mind on things above. Okay, listen. 
what happens when you set something. It's not going anywhere. You have gotten your mind on that one thing that you're about at that moment. You're coming to God. You set your mind on Him. And then you begin at this moment. And He says, not on things of the earth. Okay? You're not supposed to be thinking about other things when you come and set your mind on things above. Four, listen, this is verse three. Did you know you were dead? From God's standpoint. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. In other words, all the junk that you've done in your life is hidden. But it's hidden in Christ because he paid the sin debt. And because he paid the sin debt, the Father can only see that blood. He has a visual too. He remembers the visual of that day where his son died on Calvary. And he realized that this was the total, optimum obedience to him. So anyway, he says, For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Now, I could take time and tell you about glory, but that's another message. Okay? Colossians 3, uh, uh, 3 5, it says, Therefore, now this is getting you ready to be in the presence of God. Therefore, you put to death your members. Pluck your eye out, right? No, that is not what we're talking about here. Put to death your members, that is, whatever your members desire. Well, I'm hungry right now. Put it to death. I'm, I'm sleepy right now. Put it to death. You know, you force that body to obey the Word of God. Okay? He says, those members which are on earth, get rid of fornication. That's that either mental, physical, anything that's ever happened to you, the devil's going to want to bring it up, but you put it to death. No. Father, I'm in your presence, and these things are not going to have any way sway with me. Uncleanness. Passions. Now, the passion doesn't just mean, you know, physical or sexual passion. Any kind of a passion that you have other than what you're coming to God for. Have you had, if you have a passion for overeating, put it to death. You want to go get you a bottle of wine and, and you know, put it to death. He's saying every evil desire, put it to death. Covetousness, in other words, I need to go do this and I, I want to go buy that. And uh, everything that you're buying, you're going to leave on this side of the grave. And somebody will fight over it, and they'll leave it on this side of the grave. Amen. So because of this idolatry, this covetousness, which is idolatry, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Listen to that. That's not He didn't call them sons of God there. People that don't put these things to death in them are not sons of God. They're sons of disobedience in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them to give life to it instead of death to the flesh makes it enmity against God. Does that make sense to you? Okay. Colossians 3 uh, and 8, it says, But now you yourselves are to put off all of these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth, no cursing. Do not lie to one another, no lying. Since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him. God wants you to be like Jesus, not like you. Corruptible is corruptible. No corruption enters the kingdom. Put it off. And I'm, I'm going to get somebody that will write a dirty message. You're getting so 
that darn legalistic. I'm not getting legal. I didn't write any of this at all. I'm giving you the unadulterated word of the living God. Okay. John says this in, in the 16th chapter, verse 12 through 17. I have much more. This is Jesus speaking. I have much more to say to you, but right now, it would be more than you could understand. You know, under, you, you know what he's saying. Before the Holy Spirit came on a man, there was no way to be, and, you know, and we saw that in the activity and actions of the disciples. They looked like Larry, Moe, and Curly, just, just a comedy crew, because Jesus would say something and they'd say, show me what you're talking about. But what were they saying? He just told them something, and they couldn't take it in. Now they said, show them, and show them, and they couldn't take it in either. Having eyes to see and ears to hear, they hear, and they didn't see and they didn't hear. Okay, And he just told them that they had been given the ability to know all mysteries. But at that moment, he was speaking of something that was coming when he died and the Holy Spirit was poured out. So the Spirit shows what is true and, and will come and guide you in full truth, it says. The Spirit doesn't speak his, on his own. He will tell you only what he has heard from me, and he will let you know what is going to happen. The Spirit will bring glory to me by taking the message and telling it to you. Listen. If Jesus speaks a message, you have to give it away. If you don't tell somebody else, you're not fulfilling the, uh, the purpose that you were put here for. Now, that's not what the Word says, you know. And I look, this is exactly what the Word says. So anyway, He will tell you only what He has heard from me, and He will let you know what is going on or what is going to happen. Uh, the Spirit will bring glory to me by taking my message and telling it to you. Everything that the Father has is mine, and that's why I've said that the Spirit takes my message and tells it to you. Okay, so what does the Holy Spirit do? Okay, two things. That he gives a spoken promise, and he'll give a divine picture. I'm going to show you. That's in Genesis 12. We just looked at that a while ago in Genesis 15. But what happened to Abraham? Now, he's the father of faith, and I want you to know that the most divine measure of worship is to be able to wait on the timing of the Lord for whatever he has promised to you. Say, time passed 25 years later. He has a son. 25 years later. Then as I hold this promise and this picture in my heart and meditate on it and ponder it, God produces a miracle in the fullness of time. For Abraham, a child was born 25 years later. God has created us with eyes in, in our hearts with which we can see pictures and visualize. You don't have to have an eyeball to see. If you close your eyes right now, and I said Burger King, and I won't do that because you'll get hungry. I'll say Beach. <laughs> okay. You would you would be able to visualize the beach that you have been to, or one similar to one that you've been to. In Hebrews chapter ten, verse thirty-five through thirty-seven, it says that we have to not lose confidence because of the time period. Have you ever asked God for something expecting it tomorrow and it didn't happen tomorrow and it didn't happen next week? Now, Jesus has, a, has told us that what we do is Every day we we keep coming to the throne of grace and we pour out our petition. If it's the same one, God doesn't forget, but he, uh, he is going to, again, that's diligently seeking him. And when we diligently seek him, 
he will eventually give us what he's promised. It will be no more than he promised or no less than he promised. He has a promise that is sure. And when we know that he's going to do that, we continually thank him that he has heard our prayer and thank you, Lord, that you are faithful that is promised. I'm reminding God every day, I know that he is faithful who has promised. Amen. Well, I'm sick. Well, stay sick or go and do what he said. He said, go to the elders and have them pray for you, and the prayer of faith would save the sick. If they've committed any sins, they'd be forgiven them. Is that right? That's in James chapter 5. Is, is that the first place you stop? I can tell you over the years, it's not the first place that most religious people stop. But it should be. Amen. But anyway, he says in 10, 35 through 37, he says, Cast not therefore away uh, your away therefore your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. If you do what he said, he will do what he said. That's what that verse is saying. After you have gone to the elder of the church and you had anointing oil and there was a prayer of faith, he will reward that with the promise. Are you listening? The devil wants you to think that the, that the word of God is not true or it's been watered down, but I'm giving you the word, not a word, okay? God wants to fill our eyes with dreams and visions and images. And I'm going to show that to you in Acts chapter 2, verse 17. I've read it a couple of weeks ago when we were talking at, about dreams. And it shall come to pass in the last days. Say last days. What is this? Okay. Say, says God. Who? Okay that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Now, that's a, that's a big, you've got to understand, this is a, a great deal that he's talking about. The Holy Spirit is going to, be, before the end, he's going to pour out his Holy Spirit on all flesh. That does not mean that all flesh is going into heaven. There will be people that will actually, the enmity will be so strong and great, they will want to attack anybody that says, I'm going to go with God. Okay. But he says that your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. What are your sons and daughters going to do? Do you want them to prophesy? Okay. Your young men shall see visions. There it is. Visualization. They will see visions. The promise is given. The vision comes. They, they, they keep that in, in their head all the time before their eyes, you know, and, and what they're doing is they're meditating on the promise that God has given. The more they meditate on that thing, the more entrenched it becomes in their mind and their heart. And we're, that's what we're talking about is the, the eyeballs and the heart, you know, the, the vision that he gives you inside. And that's a very important thing for you to remember. And then your old men will be like me. Shall dream dreams. Okay. <laughs> Got a couple of us in this room that meet that criteria, right? Okay. <laughs> Je Jesus, when he was living here, and he was in pictures. He lived in pictures continuously. John 5, 19, 20, and 30, it says this, Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you that the Son can do no nothing of himself, but he, uh, what he sees the Father do. And whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. In other words, if the Father's doing it, you do it. If the Father's not doing it, forget it. Okay? For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things, say all things, that he himself does. And God will reveal himself to people 
that love him and love the Son. And he, he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. Now, that's a word, isn't it? That means your head is just scrambled up that God will do all of this. Okay? Now, Jesus is talking here. In verse 30, he says, I can, Again, I can of myself do nothing as I hear, not just as I see. As I hear, I judge and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. That deals with you as well. Whatever judgment that comes up in your old nasty brain, you need to get rid of. If it didn't come from God's Word, get rid of it. You're not given to be a judge of any man. The only one He gave you the ability to judge is you. Okay? Jesus filled the eyes of, the, uh, of his listeners by constantly teaching them with parables. In Matthew 13, 34, it says this, All these things Jesus spoke to the multitudes in parables, and without a parable he did not speak to them. What is a parable? It is word pictures. It draws pictures that people can meditate on. It, it will mollify itself inside of their spirit so that they can continue to remember what he said. However, there was a prophecy around this also that goes back into the Old Testament, having eyes to see, they see not, and ears to hear, they hear not. But listen to me. The Holy Spirit had not been poured out as of yet. Okay? Something happened after that. Disciples changed, didn't they? People by the thousands come, came to know Jesus Christ on a personal level. So anyway, the Bible tells us that we're to med meditate on the Word, which involves prayerfully rolling it over and over in our hearts and our minds. Meditate on the Word. God, show me exactly what you, what you mean. Show me what you want me to take away from this. Show me. Now remember, it is His will. He starts a work. He will finish it. And if you're asking Him to do the work, well, we can go back to Jesus who actually said, you know, if you ask for a fish, will He give you a serpent? You know, if you ask for bread, will He give you a stone? No, He wouldn't. He would give you what you ask for. The adversary is the one that says, well, He's not going to give it to you. Okay, shake yourself, get your flesh away. Okay? Do you understand what I'm saying? The adversary is going to steal from you, and you will be one of the partakers uh, of what you don't want to be a partaker because you allow him to steal, kill, and destroy. Okay? Anyway, since the Bible is full of picture stories, we will by necessity be picturing as we meditate on the Scripture. And it says that in Joshua 1.8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according, there's the obedience, do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Now I want to say to you, you want to be prosperous, and I want you to know what you, what you want to be prosperous for, okay? First of all, well, the pastor's going to get on money now. you darn straight. Tithes do not belong to you. That's the reason he uses the word bring, not give. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. Why does he do that? When you obey him, he makes a promise. Do you remember what the promise was? That he would cause all that the adversary was trying to throw at you, he would rebuke him and he would cast him out. He would bless you when that happened and all people would begin to call you blessed. He gives you pictures but the tithe does not belong to you. It belongs to God. It's holy to Him, 
and he lets you be the steward to bring it to his storehouse. That's his church. And you bring it to him, and you give it before him, and then he blesses you when you do what he says. Are you listening? Okay. Because a lot of you are getting ensnared here because of your covetousness or putting other things before God. Don't do it. It belongs to him. He says, bring what? All the tithes. All right, now listen. Uh, come now and let us reason together. If you've sinned, he gives more pictures here in Isaiah 118. Come now and let us reason together. And God's not unreasonable. He's going to give you what you need, and you need to say thank you and go away thinking about what he said. Okay? Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, and that's a red, uh, they shall be white as snow, and then though they're red like crimson, which is a little more red than scarlet, uh, which talks about the amount of sin. <laughs> they shall be as wool, okay, covered over, and he uses the picture of the lamb's wool to cover the sin. So, having said that to you, a picture's worth how many words? Okay, we, we know that Satan is saying. So when I see something, it has power to change me much more greatly than when I uh, simply think about it. That's why God says we are transformed or changed while we look in 1 Corinthians 3, 17, 18, 4, 16, and 18. Okay, I'm not going there. I know you can't stand that much gospel. When I see myself clothed in Christ's robe of righteousness in Galatians 3.20, I actually see myself in a white robe. If you don't see yourself like that, what do you see? You see now, don't go into the presence of the Lord thinking that this is not something you need to do. Go and know that you're going in in the righteousness of Christ. You have put on the white robe of righteousness. You're made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. When you go in, if you don't have that picture in your mind, you think that the adversary is going to make you a sinner before the Lord. No, you are already clean. So when I go in, I'm not going to allow him to affect my faith adversely. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? That's why it is adversely affected because you don't have a picture of this in your mind that God is looking at you as someone already clothed in the, in the righteousness of Christ Jesus. So it, in, uh, it, it influences me more when I can see a picture of it than just simply recall the scripture. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, Philippians uh, 3, 9. Uh, and God counsels us in our night dreams, as I've already told you, in Psalms 16 and 7. God will c come to you in the night hours. When you do what I'm saying, he will come to you in the night hours, and he will reveal himself to you. He will make you like his son. Listen to this. Have you ever wanted to know what was in the heart of a person because something that was going on with him? If you stay before the Lord, he will make you like Christ. You will not be deceived. He promises that you cannot. You're the elect of God at that point. You are not going to be deceived, and the deceiver will not be able to deceive you. And somebody that comes to you, and they're trying to, to deceive, and, and they want you to believe something that is not true. I don't want there to be any dichotomy between your spirit and man and and who you really are because when that happens the adversary has a playground he has a hand or a talon in her in your brain unless you put him out and start putting back in that brain what you need those pictures of what jesus did every every time he spoke to people he put word pictures in front of them 
And any religious person out there want to go, well, you're getting a little too new age for me. You are just a, uh, well, I got names for you, but I won't call you a name. I hope you'll become a Christian before it's over. Read your Bible and find out what he says about visions and dreams and visualization and the power of it. And look at our Lord Jesus Christ who did it on the pages of every page of the New Testament. Amen? Well, I'm going to close here. I personally, so if you're going to shoot, shoot at me, okay? I personally use Im imagery in all of the, ba of the ways that we were talking. That's what makes me an unshakable and unmovable because I put that picture there. That picture is stronger than me trying to recall a scripture or a scripture verse. The Holy Spirit's job is to remind me of all of the things there, and then that picture comes back into my mind, which seals the deal for me. That vision, that dream, those pictures that came into my mind, those are the things. That, now listen to me. God told me whatever I fix my eyes on uh, grows within me. And whatever grows within me, that's what I become. So instead of fixing my eyes on sin, preachers, if you're an evangelist, go into the world and preach. And if they receive you, then make disciples of them. If they don't, keep going. Don't stop. But in the church, pastors, if you're preaching that sin message every Sunday, you're missing God. You're supposed to be making disciples of them. Amen? So instead of fixing my eyes on my sin or my self-effort to become righteous, I fix my eyes on Jesus and I discover that I will become Christ-like and find myself radiating his goodness instead of the other stuff, and I will radiate his glory. Amen? All right. Father, in Jesus' name, take this word. You gave it. I delivered it, and Father, now I ask you to bring fruit from it. It's not my opinion. It's your word. It's your promises. It's what your word has established. Now, help us to have the discipline of seeing the pictures so that we not become forgetful hearers. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.